Welcome to today's lesson on average atomic mass. The question of the day is why are tests much more important to do well on than your homework assignments? In the last lesson, I spoke to you about isotopes, which remember are atoms with different number of neutrons. So we can look at carbon 12, carbon 13, and carbon 14, and those would all represent different isotopes of carbon. Carbon 13 is just a little bit heavier. Nature mostly made carbon 12s, but a few of them came out as carbon 13, and even fewer of them came out as carbon 14. Not all of our isotopes are equally popular. Sometimes you have one isotope that represents 99% of the population of all atoms of that element, and other times you'll have something like a 70-20-10 split. The average atomic mass, or the masses that we find on the periodic table, are the weighted averages of the naturally occurring isotopes of that particular element. This is why none of our masses on the periodic table come out to a whole number. They're always going to have a decimal. It represents the average. Think of it like your uh, chemistry grade in class. We're going to take your tests, your labs, your homework, and we're going to average that all together to give you a score that goes on your report card. Then all your report card scores are probably going to be averaged again to give you a GPA. This is kind of what we're looking at here. Now, a weighted average is an average where your components are not weighted equally. In a GPA, an honors or an AP class may be worth more than your standard grade level classes. That's an example of a weighted average. A weighted average would also be um, calculating your scores where your tests are worth more than your homework. If your tests are worth 50% of your overall chemistry score, but your homework is only worth 10%, then that would be considered a weighted average, where the tests have five times more of a hold on your overall average. Now, calculating a weighted average is not super difficult. In fact, we can get it in one line on your calculator. We're going to practice with your grades in a chemistry class. So let's say that your test average, fantastic grade, by the way, is a 92, and that is going to be worth 50% of your overall chemistry grade. Your homework, you got a 70 on your homework average. Skipped a few assignments, I guess. Uh, that is worth 30% of your overall score. And then your lab average with an 80 accounts for 20% of your overall score. Now, which one will have the greatest effect on your chemistry grade? I hope you said tests. Tests are worth the greatest portion, which is why they are going to largely dictate what your chemistry grade turns out to be. Even though your homework and your labs were lower than your tests, your tests prove that you really know the content. And because it's worth so much of your grade, it's actually a great indicator of um, your knowledge in the class. Now, I don't recommend this, but I took a class in college where 95% of my score in the class was split between my midterm and my final. And I had a 5% um, chunk of my grade that was dictated by my homework. So because the homework was only 5% of the grade, I entirely skipped it. I had a lot on my plate in those days. Again, I don't recommend it. My test scores did suffer because I wasn't getting the practice that I should have been getting from doing the homework. But because there was just so much going on, I said 5% is not worth it. But it didn't largely affect my grade to take the zero on the homeworks because it only represented 5% of the overall. Okay, so the weighted average, you take the amount and you are going to multiply that by the value that it has in the population as a percent. So um, we can take this test average of 92 and multiply it by the 50, and then we're going to add that to the 70 times 30, and then add that to the 80 times the 20. Now, there's two ways that you can set this up. Um, you can set it up where you just plug in the percentages and divide the whole thing by 100, or, and what this is the one that I recommend, you take your percent and immediately convert it to a decimal. So instead of doing 50%, you would do 0.5, and instead of doing 30%, you'd do 0.3. By moving the decimal two places to the right, you have effectively divided by 100, so you wouldn't have to include that in your equation. When you do the math, the average comes out to an 83, and you'll notice that it is higher than the homework average, and that's higher than the lab average. And that is because the tests have pulled this average up into the low 80s instead of it being down in the 70s. If these were all weighted equally, 92, 70, and 80 would have averaged about 
81. But because the tests are worth way more, um, we are going to bump this up a few more points. Now here is an example. We are working with isotopes of neon. We have neon 20, 21, and 22. Looking at the periodic table, this data should not surprise you. Neon's mass is 20.18, telling us that 20 is the most common isotope, which is true. It represents almost 91% of the entire population of neons. And because the mass of neon is 20.18, the 0.18 is going to indicate that there are isotopes that are larger than 20 that make up a decent chunk. So we are going to plug this into the percent abundance equation. It doesn't really have a name, but that's what I call it. Um, we would take the 20 for the mass of neon and multiply that by the 90.9% that it takes up in its population. And we're going to add that to the next isotope of neon with a mass of 21 coming in at 0.3%. And then lastly, neon 22 represents 8.8% .8 of all of the neons. When we divide this by 100, that's really just converting these percentages into decimals. Um, and then we're going to add each of these up. And if you had a fourth isotope, you could just add it to the end. Same for a fifth or a sixth. It's just at the end of this is a, a dot, dot, dot. It goes on for as many isotopes as you need. When we go and do the math, we are going to get 20.179. And that is going to come out to the um, 20.18 that appears on the periodic table. Now, here is a sample question with some data on silicon or silicon. I would love for you to pause the video and see if you could set this up. The answer you get should match the periodic table or be super close. Your periodic tables might be a tiny bit off from the data. Um, as long as these percentages are accurate, then this is um, a good indicator that you have the correct answer. My periodic table says silicon comes in at 20.09. So I'm sorry, 28.09. So this is super close. It's probably just a tiny little error. Um, in the percent abundance, perhaps these were rounded numbers to, uh, to get this data, but you should come out really close. Um, it's a great way to check because most of the time you're mostly asked to set up these questions. You're not really asked to solve them because the answers are on the periodic table. <laughs> Okay, now here's another question. The average atomic mass of chlorine is 35.45. Which isotope is most abundant, chlorine 35 or 37? And how do you know? Pause and answer the question. So the isotope, the isotope chlorine 35 must be more abundant than the uh, chlorine 37 because the average atomic mass is closer to 35 than it is to 37. I can't tell you the exact percentage of what it is, but the chlorine 35 has to represent more than 50%. If it were just a 50-50, then the average atomic mass of chlorine would have been 36 um, because the average of 35 and 37 is 36. So um, I know that 35 has to be dominating this population. So it's at least more than 50%. All right. And then last up, it says an element has three isotopes with the following mass numbers, 39, 40, and 41. The average atomic mass of that element is 39.10 atomic mass units. Which isotope is the most abundant and how do you know? This is the same question, but phrased a little bit differently. The most abundant isotope has to be the isotope with the mass number of 39. And that is because the average atomic mass is super close to 39. If those are the only isotopes, then it has to be 39 is the most abundant. Um, a lot of elements have more than just three isotopes, especially the bigger the element gets, the more isotopes it has. But on the whole, when you do these calculations, your teacher is pretty much going to ask you things um, that are mostly small. And um, just using a little bit of math knowledge, you should be able to answer all of the questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments below the video. Subscribe so you don't miss the next lesson. And I'll see you there. Bye.